It's sort of Christmas time. Well, it's close enough. Sue me. And what better way to celebrate than with a Christmas fantasy movie? No, that's not a Christmas movie. Now this is a Christmas fantasy movie. This is The Christmas Dragon, a 2014 Kickstarter indie fantasy movie by Aerostorm Entertainment, a regular here on the channel. And to add a bright red Christmas cherry on top, it's directed by John Lyde, who directed Age of the Dragons, a fantasy twist on Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick. And that movie was, uh, not so good. And for the low, low cost of $15.99 and a portion of your immortal soul, you too can own this piece of plastic holiday fantasy. I don't want to say goodness, um, well, it's something. I'm not going to waste any more time talking about the background and stuff. So let's just jump into this low-budget fruitcake. This is the Christmas Dragon. Our story follows Aiden, a young girl whose parents were killed on a surprisingly hot Christmas day in medieval Europe by a dragon. Don't worry, we'll cover this backstory a little more here in a bit, because oh boy, that's a whole thing. Anyway, six years later, Aiden now lives in a large village that uses most of the assets from the Mythica movies, and is apparently stocked with tons of hair gel. I'm not kidding. Half the kids here have enough gel in their hair could stop a small caliber bullet. Ah yes, I recall the summer winter of the year of our lord 1337. How the tapestries depicted the visage of good old Sir Dapper Danathaniel, And how the peasants would so mirthfully apply his balm to their hair. Europe used to be a proper continent. Anime hairstyle aside, Aiden lives in an abbey which takes care of a number of orphans, including herself. And it's here we meet other members of the main cast. There's Rosalind, played by Paris Warner, a cynical yet rational young woman who is in love with Garrett, played by Talon Ackerman, who is young, blonde, and a boy. Yep, that's about it. There's also Rand, played by Jacob Buster, a boy with hair so sharp and hardened by gel it would make Shark Boy cry. Hoyt, played by Ruby Jones, who is just there. And David de Villiers, who plays Finn, a rowdy, joke-cracking rebel. And when I say this boy can crack jokes, this man cracks jokes. I understand if you want to go if back- If it's a choice between following your magic rock or facing the wrath of Sister Lenora and Father Mendel, I'll take my chances with the rock. I assume you don't want anyone following you? I couldn't imagine running into anyone worse. That went well. Doesn't look like a very charitable place, Finn. How do you imagine paying for that food? My good looks. That was about to get ugly. You mean uglier. That guy was already pretty ugly. Back in her youth, Aiden used to celebrate Christmas with her family. And since Christmas is just a few days away, she puts a stocking over the fireplace. This action intrigues the other orphans who ask what Christmas is, and so Aiden and Garrett tell them. Now, you might be wondering, why don't the orphans know about Christmas? After all, this is medieval Europe, and they live in an abbey which should, you know, celebrate Christmas. The answer is that five years ago, Father Christmas vanished. <gasps> and with Father Christmas gone, people aren't getting presents. And because people aren't getting presents, they're not celebrating Christmas. Because that's... That's how Christmas works. But our spiky-haired kiddos are intrigued by Christmas. So later that day, while gathering firewood, Aiden has the idea to make a wreath to get in the spirit of the holiday. While she scampers around the woods like one of those primitive construction videos for leaves and holly berries, she comes across an elf. And not like a cute, jolly little elf, or a tall, sexy elf. No, it's more like an elf from the Elder Scrolls series. The elf explains to Aiden that the magic of Christmas is gone, and that this force called the Snarl is corrupting the elves of the north. So Father Christmas dispatched several elves with these magic rocks called Waystones, which act like a quest tracker in a video game, to find the magic of Christmas and stop the Snarl before it takes over all of the north. Considering the Snarl is such an evil force in the north, you'd imagine we might get an explanation as to why it's there in the first place, right? Or maybe the writers will tell us why Father Christmas decided to set up his workshop in the north despite knowing it's there. And surely they didn't just include the snarl in the movie as some mumbo-jumbo generic evil force so they could have a few moments of tension and drama here and there throughout the film. Nah, that can't be it. For some reason, that is not at all because Aiden is the main character of the story, the Waystone has led him to her, and because she's probably important, he gives her the stone. Since the Waystone was the only thing keeping him from going full goblin mode, no, literally, the elves turn into goblins once they're fully consumed by the snarl. It was like he went dark all of a sudden. Like all of the magic, I 
just being drained out of him. He turned into a goblin. Anyway, since the stone was all that was keeping him from going goblin, Aiden takes it and runs before he goes, as those of the frozen north say, absolutely buck nutty. Later at the abbey, Aiden recaps everything that just happened to the rest of the orphans, and she explains to them how the elf tasked her with finding the magic of Christmas. Some of the orferinos, <coughs> Roslyn, <coughs> don't think that going on a journey would be practical, while some of the other based and Christmas pilled among them, <coughs> Finn, <coughs> hears her story and just stands up and says, I'm in. Even Aiden is a little shocked by this. Based Santa believer. He also roasts the tar out of Rosalind, that humbug, for good measure. You know what, you're more than welcome to do it. Alone. No one invited you anyways. With all of our characters, except for Rosalind, on board with saving Christmas, the next day they sneak out of the Abbey. However, when the Abbey gets a few unexpected visitors, more on them in a moment, their plan to sneak out of the front falls flat. So they make like a medieval city official in Prague and yeet themselves out of the window. Unfortunately, with several members of the Abbey on their way to their room, Garrett decides to stay behind so Aiden and the gang don't get caught. Having escaped the Abbey, our heroes regroup in the woods outside of town. But they're not alone, as another Rosalind-shaped hooded figure seems to be in the woods with them. Unsure of who this stranger in Rosalind's clothing is, they manage to find the time, and the, the rope, to assemble this snare trap and capture the Rosalind-sounding stranger, who is, surprise surprise, Rosalind. They ask why Rosalind is in the woods, but she's not willing to tell them just yet. Alright then, keep your secrets. Instead, Rosalind tells them if they want to go to the north faster, and they don't want anyone to follow them, they need to go up the river. So she shows them to a boat Garrett told her about, and together they shove off and travel north using the Waystone as their guide to save Christmas. Our heroes follow the Waystone north for a bit, where they encounter a random serpent they used in Curse of the Dragon Slayer. And as is the case with most of these movies, nothing is learned, and the sequence did zip to develop anyone's characters. So it was just kind of there for the sake of it. Later they make camp, and in this scene, Aiden discusses with Finn and the others how the Waystone's magic works. She explains that basically the stone is powered by the magic of Christmas, and the magic of Christmas is a child making a wish, and the wish coming true. So, why did she get chosen if any child could use the stone? We even see Finn using the Waystone's magic after she explains this. Huh? Earlier in Aiden's tragic backstory, the dragon who killed her parents swooped down and scraped her. Now every time a dragon is near, the wound acts up like Harry Potter's scar or Vex's dragon sense from campaign one of Critical Role. So was she chosen because of her dragon sensing powers? How will the dragon sensing powers help her save Christmas? How did getting a random scrape from a dragon give her powers in the first place? The point here is, really, what makes her any more special than these kids? Is it because she remembers Christmas? You're telling me no one outside of Aiden in all of medieval Europe fondly remembers Christmas? So what makes her so special? Yeah, this reveal sort of diminishes the importance of her character just a tad. Anyway, back to it. There's also some more talking, obligatory travel montages, and finally, the Waystone brings them to a tavern on the side of the road. The mighty orphan Power Rangers enter the tavern when suddenly, Rosalind and Aiden encounter a few familiar faces. You see, these two Grinches are Jezrid and Bomtal, played by Rennie Grames and Danny James respectively. With Bomtal being a pretty silent muscle man for Jezrid, while she herself is, well, she's one of the more special characters in the movie. I don't think our lord visits many men in the dungeon. I know you. You going to come along quietly or do you need persuading? Both of them have this whole Team Rocket vibe to them. I mean, Danny's last name is James, for crying out loud. So I like to call them Team Evil. You see, in Aiden's tragic backstory, they were extorting her parents, which eventually led to them becoming Texas Flame Grilled Barbecue. Don't worry, I'll cover that whole thing in good time. And Rosalind has an at the moment unknown history with them, her and her pesky secrets. And after failing their self checks, Team Evil notices them and attempts to apprehend our heroes but not before they start a tavern brawl and sneak out amongst the chaos. However, Aiden loses her waystone in the commotion, and it's picked up by a man named Eric, played by Jake Stormowen, who's locked away in this public tavern cell because he couldn't pay his bill. Eric somehow knows about waystones, and so he promises to give it back to Aiden if she frees him, which she does. Now free, the two regroup with everyone outside of the tavern, where they spot a convenient wagon with horses and a driver all ready to go. And despite being in jail for not having the funds to pay his bill, Eric seems to be magic as he conjures what looks like a sack of coins to pay off the driver. 
This inevitably leads to a big chase scene, which for an indie fantasy movie is pretty impressive. I mean, it's slow and a little goofy, but some of the stunts are impressive, and it's a real wagon being pulled by real horses with people on horseback chasing them. It's a pretty complex sequence, and the fact that they dared to do something like that is worth noting. See? I can be nice. Sometimes. After evading Team Evil for the time being, the group takes a quick breather in the woods. Here Aiden confronts Rosalind about those pesky secrets of hers. Rosalind explains she's been bitted out, which means that when you become a certain age, you can be sold to someone to work for them. The buyers, in this case, being Team Evil. And because her dearest, whatever his face was, is also of age, Team Evil sent him to the mines. And if Rosalind hadn't escaped the Abbey, she would be there too. Yep, that's her secret. All that secrecy for what essentially boils down to Team Evil wanting to send her to the mines. Are you serious? But the new guy, Eric, isn't just some random Eric. He's an Eric with information. Information about where Father Christmas's magic ponder orb of Christmas is located. The same orb he uses to slow down time and stuff. The only issue? It's in the lair of an ogre. Now at this point, we're about 48 minutes into the movie, and we haven't seen, you know, the Christmas dragon. They wouldn't just call it the Christmas dragon and not have the, you know, dragon in the movie, right? Yeah. Depending on the fantasy movie, having a dragon not appear outside of the vital plot beats isn't really that big of a problem, mainly because those movies follow the people who slay dragons, and not the dragons themselves. This in turn saves them money since they don't have to include the dragon all the time, and instead they can focus on things that are within their budget. But this time, things are different. The dragon is not only one of the big things featured on the cover, but stuff like the trailer make it seem like the dragon is going to be a lot more involved in the movie, like the dragon is going to be a big part of their journey to save Christmas. With that being said, if I was a young kid and I saw this trailer and I picked up this DVD at Dollar General, I'd be excited because I'd totally want to see this dragon help save Christmas. But that just isn't the case. Imagine how disappointing that must be for someone excited to see like a fantasy adventure where a bunch of kids help a dragon save Christmas. Imagine if you had the How to Train Your Dragon Christmas special and there were no dragons in it, and instead the entire movie was Hiccup hobbling around the woods with the other human characters and Maybe, for like two minutes, a dragon popped in to say hi or something. That'd be ridiculous. Why even include dragons in the title at that point? My point in this is a point I've made in other reviews. And that's if you can't afford to have a dragon in your movie, don't have a dragon in your movie. Moreover, don't make it an ally or title the movie after it if it's not going to show up that much. Because really, this is just Aiden and the gang save Christmas. And there's a dragon at some point. It's deceptive and disappointing. Anyway, that uh, concludes my rant. Back to the summary. So the next day, our heroes arrive at the cave of the ogre to retrieve Father Christmas's magical orb. Because Father Christmas is a fucking wizard. Anyway, you might be asking, why did he lose the orb in the first place? And how did it fall into the ogre's hands? The answer is he lost it in a bet. But why did he bet Father Christmas's orb? Was it for money? Was it for fame? I don't know, I really don't. And the movie actively doesn't want to dwell on it either. Why in the world would you make a bet with an ogre? <laughs> so long story. <laughs> Before we can get some answers, they find this convenient nearby distraction goat to distract the ogre, while Aiden and Eric sneak inside the cave where they find the orb with no trouble. Of course, things can never be too easy, so not long after they found the orb, the ogre returns, and he is not pleased that they've taken his orb. So there's a little action sequence which results in them beating the ogre, retrieving the orb, and not being eaten, or any lessons being learned, or character development occurring, and so on and so forth. Yeah, great, yeah. Near a river, our group discovers that while the orb is intact, it seems to be sapped of magic. Not sure what to do with it, they settle on going north where Father Christmas is, and hopefully bringing it back to him will fix everything. On their way to the north, our fellowship of children, plus one man, rest in the woods before Aiden's dragon senses begin to tingle. For overhead is a dragon, which promptly gets killed by a surface air missile. Van Zandt is creaming his jeans right now. He'd be so proud. Not far away from their campsite, Eric discovers an injured baby dragon. And yes, at 58 minutes and 5 seconds, we found it. This 
is the Christmas dragon. Sure, it took two thirds of the movie to get here, but at least we got here. But that Sam wasn't just launched by anybody. It was launched by a group of bandits who live in the woods. And now they're after the baby dragon to finish what they started. So Finn gets the bright idea to don wooden masks and act like goblins to intimidate the bandits. This inevitably leads to a wacky action sequence where the kids trip, trap, and rack the bandits across the woods. Though I'm not really sure what being goblins did to help their situation. They clearly don't look like goblins, and the bandits aren't really buying it either. Oi, you're no goblin. Ah, shoot, what gave it away? The clothes, the voice, the mask, the fact I'm obviously a 14 year old human girl, it's the voice, isn't it? At one point, Aiden hears someone approaching the baby dragon, and so she rushes off to see who it is. And not far away from the baby dragon is the bandit leader, played by Adam Johnson, who, ironically, plays Father Christmas. He's also played various characters in other movies I reviewed, like that one bully guy in Dawn of the Dragon Slayer, or that one guy who bullied Olek. I don't care how much gigolo makeup you put on, I'm still never forgiving you. But because Aiden is a little level one girl armed with a shtick, and the level 8 bandits are armed with swords, axes, and knives, they feel 100% no threat from her or the stick, so they advance upon her. But before they can absolutely cleave this girl in twain, they are stopped by some lady in a hood. But she's not just any lady in a hood, she's Melanie Stone, playing Serwin, who is also an elf. What a twist! Because Serwin is a ninja monk or some shit, she beats the tar out of the bandits and sends them scurrying back into the woods. Back at the dragon, which can understand human speech, I guess? You've plenty of food and water. Stay off that wing. Can all dragons understand humans? Are we gonna discuss the implications of that? Especially at the beginning when one roasted Aiden's parents alive over what was basically a misunderstanding? You see in Aiden's TRAGIC BACKSTORY Team Evil tried to extort her parents on Christmas Day for money. And because there are only two of them, versus several members of Team Evil wearing the uniforms from Curse of the Dragon Slayer, they tell her to run so they don't take her to the mines like, what's his face? So she runs, I shit you not, like a hundred feet before stumbling into a dragon nest. These people didn't know they lived right next to a dragon's nest? Really? It's right there! Whatever, I'm, I'm getting off track. Anyway, the soldiers who were sent to get Aiden decide the eggs are worth more than her, so they start stealing them instead. The nearby Mama Dragon notices this and attacks the guards, which eventually leads the Mama to attacking the rest of Team Evil. And boom bada bing, one thing leads to another, and flame grilled parents are ready to be served with sweet baby rays. So if dragons can understand humans, could Aiden or anyone have convinced this dragon it was an accident and her parents were innocent? No? Really? Okay. Alright. Well, regardless, our heroes tell the baby to catch up with them later when it's healed, and not at all because it's an expensive asset. We also get some pretty big reveals here, like how Eric isn't just your average Eric, he's also the son of Father Christmas. What a twist! And he stole the orb five years ago because his mother, Mother Christmas, died. How she died is not important. So he had the big brain idea to use the orb to reverse time to save her, which it can't. And that's more or less why the orb is gone. The North is slowly being corrupted, and Christmas has vanished. Don't ask why he didn't bring it back, or why he lost it to the ogre. That's not important. Oh, and Serwin and Eric, you know, because he's from the North, also have a past with one another. Just thought I'd mention that. With Serwin joining the party, the group heads to the North, where they find things look a lot less like Christmas Town and more like Detroit. And much like a trip to New York City, it's not long after arriving that they're attacked by a ravenous pack of goblins. Again, not too much happens. Eric saves Serwin with his Christmas wish, which brings them a little closer. Good job, movie. At least something came out of this action sequence. The baby dragon returns. The group escapes the goblins. And they finally find Father Christmas's Viking launch. However, they find Father Christmas is about as jolly as that forgotten potato in your fridge. And even after returning the orb, it seems like the magic is gone for good. But Aiden still has hope and rallies everyone to keep fighting. Serwin tells them if they get more wishes, then it could restore Father Christmas. So they bust out the sleigh, grab the gifts in the workshop, and yoink, yoink. the list out of Father Christmas's hand. And since there's no reindeer or horses or whatever nearby, how is he supposed to pull this thing? Well, anyway, despite having none of those things, they do have a dragon. It's the Christmas dragon, baby! So with the dragon pulling their sleigh, they take off to deliver the presents and save Christmas. Eventually, they arrive at the town where a local watchman sees the dragon and the sleigh coming into the village. That's gonna come back here in a second. After landing, they go about delivering presents to everyone, and after a while, they get close to finishing their deliveries. So Aiden goes to ring the bell to wake up the town and save Christmas. 
Now, something important to note is Aiden's town frequently deals with dragons. In the beginning of the movie, the local watch rings the bell to signal a few dragons are near, which causes a little panic. And, I mean, of course it would. Every scene in the movie prior to meeting the baby dragon has shown them to be hostile creatures. So when Aiden rounds the corner leading to the village bell tower, she encounters... An angry mob who wants to kill the dragon! Oh no! Who could have foreseen that a village that frequently deals with hostile dragons would be hostile to a dragon? If only they'd known about this ahead of time! But as Aiden runs away to help the dragon, Rand gets snatched by some dude. Oh, and the same thing happens to the girl, whatever her name was. Back at the sleigh, the remaining party members are getting just a wee bit nervous since the bell still hasn't been rung, so Rosalind heads off to see what the issue is. There at the tower, she finds Team Evil has returned, and they've captured Rand, and whatever her name is. Through some poorly choreographed maneuvering, Rosalind manages to wrangle a crossbow out of Team Evil's grasp, but it turns out she can't ring the bell without two hands. But since saving Christmas is more important, she gives up her advantage to ring the bell, which wakes everyone up. And when the children of the village see their gifts, the magic of Christmas starts to flow once more, which, in turn, brings Father Christmas back to life. And as the mob gets rowdy, the kids meet up with them. And seeing how happy they are, the mob lets the dragon go this time. But just this once. That's a bit of a quick turn for people who have a long history of fearing dragons, but whatever. However, Team Evil is back at it again, and they bring out the captured children as their hostages. But since the dragon is the biggest threat to them in that moment, Jezzeret fires her crossbow at the dragon. And as Aiden steps in the way to defend the dragon, Father Christmas makes like Quicksilver and stops time to catch the bolt. And for their evil behavior, he banishes Team Evil from the village for all time. I mean, would you say no to Santa? I think not. So Team Evil leaves the village, which wraps up that thread, I, I guess. Eric also reunites with his father. Santa thanks the kids, and he basically adopts them. They all hug, and this makes it snow. You know, one of the big things we've been missing in this movie, considering it's during Christmas, which is, you know, during winter. I mean, John Light filmed an entire movie during winter. I don't know why he couldn't do it again, but whatever. Then, flying back to the north, they swoop down and scare the bandits. And in the final shot of the movie, the dragon flies across the screen and we fade to black. But not before there's a little wedding between Eric and Serwin. And now that is the end of the movie. So that's the Christmas dragon. It's... Eh. It's not the worst Aerostorm movie, but it's not really good either. In the late spirit of the holiday, let's talk about some of the pros first. One good thing about the movie is a lot of the action sequences flow naturally, and are even kind of impressive for a really, really low-budget fantasy movie. And a lot of the interior sets are also not bad considering the film's budget. I mean, sure, a lot of it is just stuff they repurposed from Mythica and other films they've made, but they're still decent sets, and despite how much I've sort of poked at them, I don't blame them for reusing assets if it means saving a buck here and there. It's also one of the more well-structured Aerostorm movies. It's pretty clear when acts begin and end, and, I mean, that should be a standard for stories. But for some of these other low-budget fantasy films, it's sort of hard to tell when an act begins and ends. And the fact this movie has definitive acts makes it easier to watch than some other fantasy movies I've seen. Some of the acting is also good. Some of it. That is. With Jake Stormowen being a standout, at least for me. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, and the uh, makeup and prosthetics aren't bad. I especially like this elf here. But what about the cons? Oh boy, are there some cons. Firstly, there's a lot of things in this movie that either don't get explained or never get a payoff. Like Aiden's dragon sensing power. What was the point of that? It just creates a lot more questions. Or what about the orb, you know, the MacGuffin? Why did Eric bet the orb in some game with an ogre when he just wanted to see if it could bring his mom back? A lot of these things could have been fixed with some simple dialogue or just writing it out of the story altogether. Because as is, those are some pretty big things that probably needed answering. On that note, there's a lot of unanswered questions by the time the film is over, like, what happened to the elves? Did they ever come back? Why is a dark, foul energy called the Snarl a thing in the north? Can all dragons understand humans? Humans? Thy guests will never know. While some of the acting is passable, a lot of it isn't, and some of the bad acting ain't even from the kids in this one for crying out loud. Also, a lot of the characters are pretty flat and probably could have been written out of the story. Like for the most part, everyone in the main group does something significant or has some greater connection to the main plot, like Rosalind having to confront Team Evil. But characters like Rand and White are just kind of there. 
I mean, they do some stuff in the movie, but it's nothing they could have just handed off to another character. Not to mention they have about as much personality as a sheet of plastic. I'm pretty sure they were put in the movie for demographic reasons, so younger kids had someone to relate to in the film. Still, I would argue they could have given them something to make them interesting or unique. Another big con is the lack of consistency with the rules the film establishes. Like earlier when Aiden met with the elf, we learn the snarl slowly malforms the elves. But when they meet Serwin, she seems just fine, minus these little dark veins they charcoal brushed onto her face. Could it be that the reason she doesn't look like a Bosmer is because she's a main character and also a love interest? Now that can't be it, you silly. Also, according to their own rules they established earlier in the story, a Waystone should have given her enough strength to fight the Snarl, especially when she looks like this, and not like this. So this moment later in the movie where she's about to succumb to the Snarl doesn't make much sense, since it it isn't consistent with the rules they established. For a movie called The Christmas Dragon, the whole dragon part of the film should have meant something a little more. Because showing off the dragon and all the marketing, and then not having the dragon show up until one hour into a one hour and 30 minute movie is just a wee bit deceptive. Like I said, I've covered this point in other reviews, so I won't discuss it further. If you want to watch this movie, there's like four different ways to watch it for free. I'll include a few of them down in the description if, in case you want to watch this movie. Though, in my opinion, the best way to watch it is in Season 3, Episode 13 of the new Mystery Science Theater 3000 series. Yeah, this was one of the movies they covered in 2022, and it's pretty funny. Yeah, and that's about all I have to say about The Christmas Dragon. I give The Christmas Dragon a 4.8 out of 10. Oh, 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 oh,